Welcome everybody to uh, Victoria Electric Vehicle Association on YouTube. Uh, please hit that subscri subscribe button so uh, we can get more people here. Tell all your friends about it. Uh, today we've been uh, we've been sitting here reading some media articles and stuff, and some people talking online, and some of them are uh, talking about insurance EVs and when something goes wrong and your your vehicle gets damaged that it's uh, it's can be a huge hassle and very very expensive and uh we're gonna have on today we have a uh, julian sale from motorized electric vehicles uh, here in victoria he has to look at insurance for vehicles a lot and uh he's got the background so we're gonna, we're gonna talk to him about the uh, the reality of, of that because uh, we're all about uh, um challenging perception and providing context here at victoria ev association so julian uh, what can we talk about this? Hey, Glenn, how are you? Good. Well, nothing bleeds like, uh, or you know what they say, if it bleeds, it reads. So I think we had recently uh, all seen this uh, newspaper article or whatever, a media thing about the Ionic 5 battery replacement cost. Mm -hmm. It made for good headlines. Um, and I'm sure a million people read it and now have uh, you know negative thoughts about EVs. But uh, yeah, the the reality is there's not a lot of, not, not a lot of, uh, not a lot of cars are cheap to fix, whether they're internal combustion or EVs. And the reality is when uh, somebody presents a, a battery damage scenario, uh, there's no body shop or insurance company that has any way of fixing a battery. So it does uh, create problems for sure. But uh, it's like if you put a you know, scratch in a transmission in a car and say, well, that might affect the car. Well, the insurance company is obligated to fix it or repair it, but nobody's going to fix it. So yeah, insurance can be a, a sticky, disastrous mess, regardless whether it's an EV or a gas car for sure. Yeah, and I mean, especially like insurance companies, their whole things are actual actuarial tables, right? They need data to make a decision on anything. So anytime anything new comes onto the market, they don't have the data. They don't know how to uh, judge the risk on anything. So um, yeah, I think it's it'd be kind of natural for them to look at something where they don't have the data and go, oh, we're not really sure. And, you know, and, and, and if we spend the money to fix it, whether it'll be a problem down the line. So let's write it off. Do you think that's part of it? Uh, I think that over the past few years, there have been a number of significant factors that have that have affected the insurance industry in, in unusual ways. For example, you know, a few years ago, um, and there was a shortage of cars to be produced and whatnot. And there was also a shortage of, well, the shortage of cars uh, being produced was caused by the shortage of parts. So just as a part shortage caused problems for uh, new car manufacturing and assembly, you can't build a car if you don't have the parts. We also can't fix a car if you don't have the parts. So the insurance uh, industry kind of got turned upside down, uh, you know, starting around the COVID time because uh, it was impossible for them to repair vehicles without having access to parts. Um, so that, that started to cause a lot of problems. Um, there's also the advanced driver assistance systems, which are, which are making cars uh, much safer and less likely to get into accidents in the first place, which, uh, is certainly, uh, changing the dynamics of the body shop industry for sure. But yeah, I mean, it's kind of a deep subject. Uh, where do you want to go here? Well, we just, we, we, like I say, we're trying to provide some context to it. So... Uh, I know you have some experience because uh, you're you're trying to get cars insured or fixed uh, all the time. Yeah, it's um, here's what I can tell you about insurance is that uh, well, you know, we had a phone call or a conversation the other day, and we talked about uh, you know like this Ionic Five thing came up. It, I, I my my neighbors have a body shop, or I should say, across the way from my commercial uh, service address, I have a body shop, and it used to be a smaller operation. It was part of a group of, of I think, two stores. And uh, the owner told me twenty odd years ago that with the advent of uh, ADAS systems on cars, he predicted um, that that cars were just going to be less likely to be involved in fender benders, which are high margin, quick turnover repair jobs. And he had speculated that as smart cruise control and automatic braking and collision avoidance and lane keep assist and all this stuff sort of proliferated in common vehicles at a lower price point, which it has done. Um, you got to remember all these anti-crash things were options on high-end cars in the beginning. And now, now they're on every car, but uh, essentially that, that kind of painted a picture that made it look like uh, 
body shops might not be getting these small gravy jobs. Like, you know, when cars had steel bumpers, somebody had a fender bender, you fix the bumper and the fender, you put the steel parts on, you're all good. It's all fine. But the cars were low tech and they were easy to fix. Now they're not low tech and they're not easy to fix. Everything's got a sensor in it and everything's got, anyway, they're just more complicated and they're more expensive. And they take a lot of time to take apart, put back together and whatnot. Yeah. And, I, think uh, you're, I think you were talking about an example of a, uh, of a high-end German autom automotive uh, maker. Oh who, yeah. Mercedes car. bumper. Yeah. 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 Tell us about that. Well, okay. So <laughs> it's interesting. You know, if you look at the, okay, so there's a big dis discrepancy between different types of cars. If you look at something like a Honda fit, it's super plain. There's not a lot of parts and pieces going off there. If you take the front bumper off that car, it'd probably maybe take you half an hour or something like that. If you take the front bumper off a Tesla Model 3, it'd take you about eight minutes or something. I mean, it's really fast. Uh, but uh, for a lot of modern European cars, you could be 12 hours to remove and reinstall the entire front bumper with all the associated uh, active air grill shutters and componentry that's attached to the backside of the bumper and maybe a grill that's made of five or six different components. And you've got ultrasound sensors that pop in and you've got there's just like an insane number. You've got wiring harnesses. You've got like many light. There's so many components. So the cost in the old days to fix a front bumper on a car was the cost of the front bumper and maybe an hour to put it on and take it off. And on a new car, you could be $3,000, $4,000 just to repaint a front bumper on a car because of the labor associated with the, with the change out times. And so this kind of thing affects internal combustion and electric vehicles alike, but some manufacturers uh, build their cars in such a way that they're easy and cheap to service. So when you hear the insurance companies talking about challenges it's like well what brand are they talking about they're not all the same you you, uh, you just brought to mind um previous generations of uh of teslas had the ultrasonic sensors up in the front bumper and what a year year and a half ago tesla started making cars that they took all the ultrasonic sensors out and they're using yeah. the, the nine camera vision on the car yeah. Yeah, Tesla Vision to to you know see how close you're getting to that uh, that uh, wall when you're parking your car and stuff and uh, and that has been yeah uh, it's been kind of hit and miss on how effective it is but a lot of people have been bitterly complaining about it perhaps they won't be bitterly complaining if it's cheaper to fix not having all those there what do you think about that. Well, I mean, the, the reason why Tesla pulled those sensors out of the car is because they figured over time software would be able to catch up to and reproduce the functionality of the sensors. The sensors are like 15 bucks each at a manufacturing level or 13 bucks or something. But in the retail end, they're probably 150 bucks a pop or something like that. So it's pretty expensive. So yeah, Tesla cut uh, cost by removing uh, a, a, a component, which is common in almost almost every car nowadays. And uh, yeah, it saves money and time on the assembly line, but it would also save, save money and time on the, on the repair bill if there's an accident involved as well. Having said that, though, Tesla is an unusual example because their uh, equipment is manufactured in such a way that it is like it's designed in such a way that it's easy to manufacture. But, I mean, but like, you know, the Mercedes S class front bumper, for example, they don't care if it's easy to service. It's not a concern. It has to be easy to build but they don't care if it's easy to service. They want it to look a certain way and perform a certain way and whatnot. So yeah. Tesla operates within a strange number of constraints that the other manufacturers, it's not even on their radar. They don't care yeah. how simple it is to service. Yeah, for a manufacturer, they care about you know the effort it takes to build, but as soon as it's out of the factory door, they don't care. And in fact, if it costs a lot of money and time to fix, then their dealers are very happy to do that because yes. that's half the money that they they work with all the time. Well, yeah, probably more like two thirds of the money that comes through the average wow. dealership might come from uh, service income. And yeah. so, I mean, you know, obviously every dealer wants to deliver the best ownership experience to their clients, but that doesn't mean that all brands are equally affordable to maintain. So, yeah, some some brands are going to cost a lot more to maintain just because yeah. of the way they're engineered. Companies like Tesla and, and Rivian and, and those who aren't building out huge dealer networks, they don't necessarily want uh, something that, that takes a lot of time to fix uh, You know, if there's a problem. Well, complicated things are more likely to fail and take a bunch of time to fix. And during the warranty period, after a manufacturer has produced an item, whether it's a microwave or a TV or whatever, 
or a car, uh, the manufacturer is obligated to cover the repair costs to fix the item if it breaks down in a way that's covered by warranty during the warranty period. So if you're a young company that has the majority of its fleet on the road still under warranty instead of, you know, like you think about how many Fords are on the road that are out of warranty. Well, every time somebody breaks apart on an old Ford that's out of warranty, Ford gets to sell apart. That's a win. They get, you know, the dealership's going to make some money and the, hopefully their service department's going to make some money installing those parts. If you think about Tesla, their position was really challenging in the beginning because uh, when they started production, every single car they made was under warranty. They were to have no after parts sales service. They had no no way to to make revenue selling parts to maintain a fleet of cars that have been on the road for decades. So instead, they were in a really rough position financially because they were obligated to pay for any service cost that would be associated with a warranty claim on every single car they make until some of them eventually timed out, which from a battery and drivetrain perspective starts at eight years. So that means 2020 was the time that 2012 Model S has finally ran out of battery warranty in most cases. And a lot of those had unlimited mileage warranty. So Tesla learned a lesson as a newer startup car company uh, that didn't have all this income stream for old stuff on the road, millions of cars on the road consuming parts, Tesla learned that through good engineering up front, they can make the cars more reliable and less likely to break down and cause problems for their bank account. Uh, while these things are under the warranty period, it, the, the, the catch-22 is that they're unlikely to sell a lot of parts as the cars get older. You know, it's when these cars fall off warranty, they're not going to start breaking down. They're actually super reliable because they were engineered to be reliable and cheap up front. So yeah, and, and the, like the legacy, in that. Yeah, and the, the legacy cars, you know, the 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 brand, you know, the thing they mainly make is the drivetrain. Yeah, pretty much everything else comes in from somewhere else. So once the car is made, you know, uh, Ford, GM or whatever, they've paid for that part from that supplier. But everything after that is was from the repair market, you know, being sold off to the dealers. So, you know, they're looking forward to having another eight or 10 years of parts being requested by the dealer on behalf for that car. I mean, so, so oh, for sure. Third, yeah, those third line or sec, second or third line manufacturers are they're looking forward to all that uh, money. And, and those people really don't exist for some companies. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, yeah, it's fascinating for sure. Yeah, right on. Um, is there anything else that any question I didn't ask you that you 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 think that we should get into? Well, I think we had briefly maybe maybe it was before the video started, but we talked about um, uh, yeah, automotive manufacturers collecting data from drivers. Oh yeah. Did we touch on that? The uh, you know, and it's interesting because when Tesla started selling insurance to their now, I don't think Tesla sells insurance in BC yet, but they are coming to Canada soon. I heard. Uh, at some point they will, and it's not in every state in the U.S. either. But there are a number of states where you can buy Tesla insurance. Yeah. Okay. So the thing is, Tesla insurance because their cars are very heavily sensorized, and the user can either agree to or decline to share driving data. Tesla looks at the driving history of, the, of the, the consumer in that vehicle and can price the insurance premiums according to how they know the car is being driven, which I think is a fabulous idea. But uh, it seems like uh, maybe perhaps the media is portraying a situation where people are being unwillingly monitored or un unknowingly monitored by insurance companies. And the insurance companies know how you drive. To some degree, that's been like, I guess, as, I mean, Cars are fairly sensorized, and a lot of cars are, are connected online, but but driver data isn't available to the manufacturers uh, of vehicles unless there's an accident and the police get involved, and it's like you have to go digging to retrieve black box info from cars. So it's not like insurance companies have any idea what you're doing unless you um, willingly and voluntarily agree to have them monitor your vehicle. Um there are a number of companies that sell an OBD2 uh, unit with uh, a GPS uh, component in it. So, for example, a fleet operator like maybe, uh, you know, BC Hydro or TELUS or somebody who operates a huge fleet might actually put one of these devices or you just plug it into the OBD2 unit in any of your fleet vehicles. 
And if you plug in a thousand of these things, then you'll have all the driving data from your thousand cars in your fleet. And of course, if you're a big fleet operator, you're going to want to share that info with your with your insurance company in order to make sure that they know how your fleet drivers are are, are performing. So, yeah, it's not it's not an unusual thing to talk about. But uh, Tesla is the first manufacturer that's uh, sort of connected straight with the consumers and then sold an insurance product that is dynamically priced based on the driver's behavior. It's kind of cool. Yeah, it is. I mean, <clears throat> we both know people who will never, ever go for that <laughs> because uh, uh, accurately pricing their risk level would be uh, ruinous to their ability to pay. But for most people, it's going to be a good uh, a good thing. Um, yeah, no, that, that's, good. that's good. I think most people are pretty good drivers most of the time. It's just that occasional thing that goes sideways that gets us, you know. Yeah, let's go with that. <laughs> sure, sure, Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully they don't monitor my motorcycle. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no comment, right? The motorcycles, yeah, they, they don't count. <laughs> okay. Well, th uh, thank you, Julian. Uh, thanks for uh, coming on to talk to us about this. Um, yeah, great. Always fun to talk about uh, insurance and uh, all the other exciting stuff that revolves around EVs. Right on. Well, until Beautiful. next time.